You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, David. Hello, Will. And hello, listeners. Welcome to episode 142 of the Common Descent Podcast. This episode, we will be discussing phytosaurs. Uh, Round one, (laughs) phytosaurs. One of my friends did ask what we were talking about next, and I I told them phytosaurs, and they were like, phytosaurs? Is this from the 90s? Phytosaurs is an extremely fitting topic for the month of June. Yes, because it is croc month. Croc month! Phytosaurs aren't really crocs, but I'm sure we'll get into that. Yes. So phytosaurs are an interesting group popularity-wise. To me, phytosaurs are one of the most iconic fossil groups. And um, to many paleontologists, they are very well known. But they are publicly very underrepresented. Right. Like, I do not see phytosaurs mentioned or portrayed or displayed in public popular media. Even, like, toys. I recently tried to see if I could find any phytosaur toys online and couldn't find any. So this group has kind of gone under the radar popularity wise this is a triassic group of reptiles so early early mesozoic at the beginning of the age of the dinosaurs and reptiles that on the surface look very croc like that is what they're famous for absolutely is for being like a more familiar group of animals yes and they were very successful during this time so we're going to talk a bit about what they are how croc like were they Mm mm-hmm And what do we know about them? Because though they are a famous and fairly well-known early Mesozoic group, it's still early Mesozoic. So there's a lot of mysteries that we're still trying to uncover with this croc-ish group. Now, we'll be discussing them because I love phytosaurs. Very cool animals. (laughs) This is one of my favorites. I've been looking forward to this episode. But also because it is requested. Like all our episodes these days, this was requested by, specifically this time, Jonathan and Rip Rattle. Thanks! Yeah, no, this was a great suggestion. Thank you. And we found the right month to do it in. Yep. Now, before we get to the episode, let's get some announcements out of the way. First announcement, as usual, we have a Patreon, which funds our podcast top to bottom. It allows us to keep the lights on. It allows us to do extra goody things like trips and get new equipment and all sorts of stuff like that. And if you sign up, you will get bonus stuff yourself, bonus recordings, bonus info about the episodes, uh, opportunities for live chats and stuff like that. But also at certain levels, you will get your name shouted out here on the podcast. And today we would like to welcome and thank Orion, Chris, Richard, Kyle, and John. Thanks, new patrons. Thank you so much, and thanks to all our patrons for your support. And speaking of extra content, this month, as we said, is Croc Month. It's Croc Month! All June long, it's Croc Month. We decided this year that we're doing Croc Month in June and Snake Month in July, so you will hear the Croc theme popping up in all of our stuff across June, including an episode about phytosaurs. We've also got Croc stuff popping up all month on social media. We got a whole Croc chat channel on our Discord server. Links down in the episode description. We very recently released our Croc Month bonus episode. Yes. Where we talked about Croc conservation with Dr. Marissa Teas from Belize, which was very, very cool. So much fun. All this stuff continues throughout June, and then next month in July, it'll be all snake-themed stuff. And during these two months... We have a unique, limited-time Patreon tier. The Crocs and Snakes tier is now live on Patreon, and patrons who subscribe at this level will not only receive lots of goodies, but the donations we receive at the Crocs and Snake tiers in June and July will contribute to charitable donations that we will be making at the end of the summer to Snake and Croc conservation efforts. So if you're not following us on social media, or not joining our Discord server, or not subscribing to us on Patreon, but you'd like to, you've been thinking about it, these months are an excellent time to do it. We've got all sorts of extra cool bonus stuff going on. And the bonus stuff doesn't stop there. 
This month, we also have two new silver screen sciences that have come out recently. That's true, because Prehistoric Planet came out recently, the documentary. And we did a silver screen for Jurassic World Dominion, the final (laughs) entry into the Jurassic (laughs) World franchise. We had lots to say, so much to say. Oh, yeah. About the science of Jurassic World Dominion that is available for everybody. And if you're a patron, again, bonus stuff. We've put out a More Thoughts episode where we talk not sciencey views, but just our personal feelings about the movie. And for one last bonus <laughs> bit we're, of audio. We're real busy this summer. <laughs> this, this was a busy month, but awesome <laughs> stuff. We appeared on an episode of the podcast Third Pod from the Sun. Yeah, the AGU podcast, Third Pod, where we were invited on to talk about the end Cretaceous mass extinction. Yep. And that's available. That also will be linked in the episode description. Check all the stuff out. It's, yeah, we've been doing a lot. We can have a paragraph of links. <laughs> but now, with all the announcements out of the way, we can move on to our first official section, the news. Every episode, we like to cover some recent scientific news. Paleo, evolutionary, e- ecology, biology, all these different categories. This helps us keep up to date. It helps us keep all of you up to date. And to start us off, David, what's the news? Well, since we're doing an episode about Mesozoic archosaurs, my first bit of news is about a dinosaur belly button. Oh. Yeah. Cute. It's weird. (laughs) This is research by Phil Bell et al. in BMC Biology. And the article we will be linking to in the blog post, which will also be linked in the episode description, is an article about the study in Science Alert by Carly Casella. I think it's safe to assume that all of our listeners are familiar with the concept of a belly button, scientifically called an umbilicus. Yes, and if you're not, you can take a moment to to check right now. Double check. And you'll find one near you. Please see your doctor (laughs) if you do. The belly button is the little mark in our middle part of our body that is left behind from the umbilical cord. Yeah, it's the scar. It's the scar. So we placental mammals, when our when we are fetuses developing inside of a womb, an umbilical cord connects our bodies to the placenta, which is helping with nutrition and waste removal and all that good stuff. When the umbilical cord breaks away, it leaves behind a belly button. Mammals are not the only ones that get this. Reptiles have a version of this. Reptiles don't t- typically have a placenta, but the, the embryos do form a tether with the yolk sac and the allantois, which are also for providing nutrients and removing waste. And that can also leave behind a reptilian version of an umbilicus, which can uh, preserve as a little line or crease or sometimes as a distinct scar, very much like our mammalian belly buttons. Yeah. But... No umbilicus has been known in any pre-Cenozoic animals until now. This research examines a very, very well-preserved specimen of Psittacosaurus from China. We've talked about this specimen before. Psittacosaurus is an early, small ceratopsian. Mm -hmm. So the ceratopsians, episode 87, the group that includes the horned dinosaurs, This specimen of Psittacosaurus is the famous one that also preserves quills and preserves coloration and preserves a butthole. It's been in the news quite a bit because the soft tissue is preserved exceptionally well. The specimen's about 130 million years old, and like I said, from China. These researchers employed laser-stimulated fluorescence, which is a technique that allows us to basically spot features on a fossil that are otherwise not noticeable in normal visible light. Yeah, energizing it so that different things light up under the right camera. And when they did so, they found a little crease or scar along the midline of the body, right about where you'd expect a belly button to be, with two uh, even rows of scales delimiting it on either side. They note that the size and the shape of the scales around this little crease seem normal and consistent. Okay. Suggesting that this isn't just an injury or disease or something that went wrong during the life of the animal. Yeah, the skin's not uh, disformed. Yes. Instead, they point out, and here's our June tie-in, that it looks very similar to the umbilicus of alligators. Yeah! Modern day crocodilians will sometimes have this same feature. 
And this is when we get into the interesting topic of comparing it with modern reptiles. This feature is seen across modern reptiles, including birds, but most of the time, the scar disappears very early on. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. within days or weeks after hatching, that little crease or line or whatever was left there disappears as the skin and scales take their final shape. So you don't see it in a lot of adult reptiles. But in some uh, squamates and some lizards, and I think snakes, as well as crocs, it can last until adulthood and sometimes the entire life of the animal. They will have this little belly button. This Psittacosaurus, based on the features of the skeleton, is not fully adult, but very close. Yeah. The, the authors described it as nearly at sexual maturity. So, so it's it's about full grown, but, you know, not not moved out yet. Yeah, exactly. It's still living in the basement. <laughs> and the fact that it is nearly at sexual maturity suggests that in Psittacosaurus, this little dinosaur belly button would have lasted at least until maturity and possibly later, like we see in a lot of modern reptiles like crocodiles. This is so such a cool study and find. The, the two reasons that I love this. One, this specimen is like the Rosetta Stone it, of dinosaur soft anatomy. It is giving us a bunch of information that is simply impossible to get anywhere else. Yeah, just it really allows us. And like some of these things may not be ground shaking. You know, oh, we this completely changes the way we look at dinosaur. Right. But this is information that we never thought we would get. Yes, it's, it's information we never thought we'd get. It does tell us interesting evolutionary uh, comparative anatomy things mm-hmm. and super useful for artists. Yes, exactly. I want dinosaur belly buttons. <laughs> <laughs> it also makes me wonder if there is like some significance to the development of the groups that do maintain the scars. Like, yeah, I don't know if it's just random. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is it just it just is a quirk of that group? Like, yeah, you know, they just. They don't lose their scar, uh, or is it? Is there something about that type of yolk sac or something? Yeah. Is there a connection between why we do and don't see it? Yeah, I don't know. I, I didn't see it mentioned. And indeed, the authors do point out that the shape and duration, the longevity of the umbilicus, this scar, is so variable in modern day reptiles, but like even within lizards and snakes, it varies yeah. and it probably varies within crocodilians that they are, uh, uh, they specify to point out just cause this one dinosaur has, it does not actually tell us anything about any other dinosaurs. Yes. Because it could be just as variable among dinosaurs. This could be the one group that has a long lasting umbilicus, or it could be that all dinosaurs had it or somewhere in between. So we will simply have to find exceptionally well-preserved specimens of all the other dinosaur yes. species <laughs> to well, know if they had belly buttons. It's like, you know, we have evidence for noise making in certain dinosaurs. So like we can find the resonating chamber, right. but we don't know that that means every other dinosaur was equally as noisy. Like, Especially since in modern animals, it is extremely variable. Yes. So, so there, it, it could easily be variable in dinosaurs. There are some biological things that one, uh, one does not even begin to set the rule. Yes. Well, speaking of things that are adorable, <laughs> tiny frogs is what my next is what my news is on. These specifically the ability to jump in itty bitty frogs oh, and more specifically, the ability to jump well. <laughs> huh? Yeah. This is research by Richard Esner Jr. et al. in Science Advances. And the article is by Gerald Pinson in Florida Museum News. So the reason this research is looking at frog jumping is specifically because of the size of certain frogs. Frogs are some of the smallest vertebrates. Uh, They are itty bitty. Frogs, episode 91. And one of the side effects of being so small is that your organs also must be itty bitty. You gotta gotta fit all those organs in a very small space. Exactly. And some organs, that changes how they can function. Specifically, what they were looking at is the vestibular system. This is the tube system that is part of your inner ear. If you remember your old biology books about like the inside of your head, it is the one that has those loops of tubes coming off of it. And these loops are filled with fluid and hairs. And when you move your head, the fluid moves through the tubes and adjusts the hairs and the hairs 
send signals to our brain with information of that movement. Right. It helps you with your orientation. This is what I believe is what gets messed up if you spin around really fast yes. or something. And that's, that's why you get dizzy. Yeah, because the fluid continues to spin after you stop. <laughs> so your brain still thinks you're moving. It's trying to adjust. And that's why you feel like your head won't stand still. Right. Because your brain's going, no, we're still going to the left. <laughs> it's like, no, we're not. This is your gyroscope, and it is important for maintaining your orientation, both in like balance, as you said, but also quick movements and adjusting in the air if you're a flyer or something like that. With these tiny frogs, their vestibular system is also very tiny. The frogs they're looking at specifically are known as pumpkin toadlets or flea toads. They have adorable names. Yes, they're very, they're just these little pea-shaped bodies of frogs with itty-bitty stick legs coming off. <laughs> These are from the group Brachycephalus, and they are a well-known tiny group of frogs from Brazil. This study looked at four species because these frogs and toads, toadlets, can jump. Like, they're perfectly fine at being able to jump. The videos that you'll see in some of the links is they just prod them a little bit and they will jump, but as soon as they jump... Mid-air, they just start tumbling. Oh, no. <laughs> they just immediately lose their direction. They'll face plant. They'll land on their back. They'll land backwards and upside down. They'll just tumble and splat on the ground. <laughs> they're fine. They get back up. No, but they're tiny. They're tiny. But they do not maintain their trajectory that they're facing while jumping. Huh. They lose all control. So they wanted to take a look at this vestibular system to see how has this miniaturization affected it in these frogs. They use something called OVERT, which is, uh, a, to my understanding, a database that is a bunch of C 3T models from CD scans of tons of species. They pulled from that, stitched together hundreds of frog scans, and got a look at this inner ear balancing system, and found that it stands out notably. First, it's the smallest recorded of any adult vertebrate. Oh, cool. It is so tiny. And the size, you know, the fact that it's tiny makes sense because they are small. But the size of a vestibular system to the size of an animal makes a difference. The article made a note that, like, in whales, their inner ear system is about the same size as ours. Because they're a big animal and it's not going to make a huge difference. They don't need super large canals to be able to balance. When you get small... To have a appropriately sized vestibular system, it starts taking up more and more space in your head. And in these frogs, it's as big as it can get, but it's still... Not big enough? Super compact. They described it as looking like overinflated balloons. Weird. There are pictures. I can't remember if they were in the paper or on the news article, but there are images. Link in the blog post. And... They show you what their systems look like. You cannot distinguish the actual tube, the loops. Oh. There's no gap that you can see between the loop and the rest of the structure. Strange. It's just lumps. This is where physics comes in and messes it up for the frogs. When you restrict the size of a tube of a pipe, liquid flows differently. Mm -hmm. You can't have, you can't scale piping and have it behave the same the smaller and smaller you get. And at that small a scale, the liquid can't flow fast enough to let them react quick enough to give them the information they need to adjust themselves mid-jump. So because it's so small, it's restricting the, re the sensitivity of their vestibular system. Wow. So these frogs have gotten too small. Yes. They have gotten too small to properly be frogs. Mm -hmm. I guess they have to just plan ahead. Yeah, right? <laughs> I'm going to go land over there somewhere. You better look before you jump and make sure it's a safe place to land. Well, it's like old school artillery where it's just like, we're firing in this direction. <laughs> we're going to carpet this square mile and just... Well, it makes me think of there was an episode of Animal Planet's The Most Extreme where they were talking <laughs> about speed and the tiger beetle came up. Yes. And... I don't, I haven't seen this discussed anywhere else. So this, I don't know how true this is, but they were saying that the tiger beetle moves so quickly that it can't see while it's running. Yeah, it can't process the information it's getting from its eyes quick enough to change its trajectory. So they depicted it having to move in bursts. Yes. That you run a little bit and stop and look around and then run a little bit and stop and look around. This seems like you'd have to function very much like that is look, 
jump, get back up, <laughs> and then look where you're going and jump again. Yep. This is the issue all superheroes that move faster than light would have. Yes. Is you technically can't <laughs> see if you're moving faster than light. Yep. Sorry, so Flash. You'd have to move in a straight line and then stop and go, okay, what's happened? I guess it's uh, the, the fortuitous thing for these frogs is that they are extremely small. So tumbling to the ground is very l- unlikely to be harmful. Oh, yeah. These these animals at this size can't fall fast enough to hurt themselves right. from a free fall. That the air is too thick for them. <laughs> uh, now, one note they did also make, which just makes it all the funnier, is that they're not great jumpers. They're also not great walkers. Like, oh, man. they have these itty-bitty little legs, <laughs> so they just kind of have to tiptoe up and then do this, like, stilt, like, just move their arms and legs in these little stompy motions. Very man. inefficient these at frogs, moving around. These are, the, you guys <laughs> just, you're just not having a great time. <laughs> <laughs> that is ador- it is an adorable side effect of the conflict between body shape and body size yep and what your body is adapted to do and what your body is capable of doing yes can conflict oh what a weird what an odd quirk of evolution well once again for my next bit of news i am staying true to the spirit of the season my next bit of news is about snakes Uh. snakes specifically we are returning to the subject of snake venom evolution this time at a broader scale than we have discussed it before. All right. This is research by Blair Perry et al. in the journal Genome Research, and we will link to a press release in Science Daily. We have talked about snake venom in the past, snakes episode 3, venom episode 97, but also snake venom evolution has come up in the news at least a couple times before. Because it is a very complex system, it is very variable, and a lot of research has gone on to how did this evolve, what are all the steps that it took. One of the famous things about the evolution of snake venom is that the genes that code for the particular toxins that are that make snake venom dangerous are largely co-opted from other parts of the genome. Yeah, that they existed already in their DNA, but are now being used for this purpose. Yeah, so a lot of the genes that produce toxin proteins are genes that formerly were creating other proteins and enzymes for the digestive system or for the nervous system, the immune system, and they have been repurposed and sometimes modified into something that functions as venom. And then those genes and their corresponding proteins are stored in a specialized gland, which is likely evolved from a salivary gland, where the genes are, and this is a great term, (laughs) overexpressed, as they produce a ton of these protein end results. They make very spicy spit. Very, very spicy. This research focuses in on the evolution of snake venom genetics, but not the genes that code for the toxins themselves, but the genes that regulate the production and expression of those other genes. Okay. So this is the regulatory network. So our genes don't just, you know, activate and turn on. Different genes are activated in different parts of the body, in different situations. It is a very complex system. And all that variability is regulated by other genes that tell the other genes to turn on now or to turn off now or whatever they need to do. Yeah, a lot of times DNA gets represented as like a recipe that like you read this and it tells the body what to do. But Mm -hmm. more accurately, it's like an interactive instruction manual where it's like, yes, if if situation A, please turn to page 65, follow the instructions starting at step three, like. (laughs) That's what the DNA is doing, is responding to the situation and activating or deactivating based on what your body is experiencing. Snake venom toxins have to be produced only in certain parts of the body. They also have to be stabilized. They have to be stored for long term, right? They sit in the glands and are ready for when the snake has to use its venom. All that activity surrounding the production and maintenance of venom is regulated by these regulatory genes. So this research examined the genome of prairie rattlesnakes, Crotalus viridus, to identify all the different components of the regulatory network. So this includes genes that regulate nearby genes in the genome, genes that regulate faraway genes, 
a G- regulatory cascades. So sequences of genes controlling genes controlling genes. And all this complex genetic control within the venom system. With the goal of getting an idea of how did this evolve. And just as the venom itself is a complex mixture of different proteins and enzymes coded for by a complex series of genes. The regulatory network is a complex series of genes, and we know that a lot of the individual toxin genes were co-opted from other parts of the genome. This research found that a lot of the regulatory genes were also co-opted from other parts of the genome. That makes sense. Specifically, they noted that a lot of the regulatory network was co-opted from other processes involved in regulating certain cellular reproductive processes, a system known as extracellular signal-regulated kinase pathways, (laughs) and unfolded protein response, which the internet tells me has to do with cell homeostasis. Oh, okay. So these are regulatory networks that help cells maintain being healthy and maintain reproduction. These systems, those genes were co-opted and repurposed to regulate the venom system. Oh, okay, yeah. In snakes. So just like the individual toxin genes came from other parts of the genome, so did the genes that control the toxin genes. But not the same places. Interesting. And not all in the same method of co-option. They found that there are various evolutionary processes in the genome that all contributed to this. For example... In one venom family, the serine proteases, which is a thing, a bunch of stuff that breaks down proteins, the regulatory genes for those proteins seem to have evolved uh, in part because of the action of transposable elements, which are chunks of the genome that hop from place to place. Yep. They have moved from one part of the genome to another, thus introducing new potential functions in two parts of the genome that they weren't previously. Which is, that's just so chaotic. That <laughs> is, it happens all the time. There are a lot of gen- genetic research goes into jumping genes. Yeah. <laughs> in other cases, regulatory genes from these other systems were just duplicated mm-hmm. and then repurposed. So not only did the evolution of venom toxin genes involve the combining and repurposing of lots of other parts of the genome, so did the evolution of the regulatory network that controls those genes, which came from different other parts of the genome. And they all, all this process came about by multiple varied different mechanisms of genetic evolution over time. That this wasn't like a single pathway that snakes followed and oops, we will, we are going to produce this venom. It is just this chaotic mixture of all sorts of different ingredients and processes that created the incredibly complex system that exists currently as the snake venom genetic system. This is such a wonderful example or or case study almost to really demonstrate some of the fundamentals of evolution. That like, A, this incredibly complex and specialized feature of snake venom which is just so notable for this group outside of basically any other vertebrate group for sure came from things from building blocks. They already had in their body Mm -hmm. genes. They already possessed, you know, they did not just invent venom out of nowhere. Evolution didn't just create it out of nothing. It used the building blocks that were present. That's how evolution functions. But also it emphasizes that DNA is not this static structure Yes. That DNA is constantly changing, usually on a scale that doesn't matter. But mm-hmm. like your DNA, when it replicates, mistakes are made, copies are made, things are deleted. You know, you're losing and gaining little bits of your DNA all the time. But typically it's enough to be either repaired or it doesn't matter to your overall functioning. But it makes sense how so how things could get switched or shuffled in surprisingly beneficial ways over millions of years. Yeah. Like it's this just for me encapsulates the workings of evolution so beautifully. Yeah, and they the authors point out that what makes this study uh, important and interesting 
is in part what you just said is, yeah, how do complex systems come about? This is an incredible case study for understanding that. This could serve as a model for how to understand other complex systems. Absolutely. So we could potentially apply this same sort of genomic study to immune systems or brain function or anything else that is a complex system in the, in the body. But also, they point out that one of the reasons why snake bites are so challenging to deal with worldwide is because of just how variable snake venom is. Yeah. Varying from species to species, sometimes from population to population. So this is also contributing to an improved understanding of how different venom systems evolve, how they vary from each other, and importantly, how they are regulated. Mm -hmm. Because that can really be important for us in figuring out how to counteract the activity of those venoms in cases where we need to do that. Yeah, just a, a deeper understanding of this this biological agent. Yes, and in, in case anyone's wondering why snake venom has popped up as a discussion in this podcast over and over again, particularly in the news, is because it is the subject of tons of research for that exact reason. Oh, yeah. But snake venom is one of globally the most important negatively impacting substances on human beings. Yeah. Like especially in parts of the world where there are more venomous snakes and less accessible healthcare. Yeah, if you're in more remote or more, more tropical isolated, yeah. Or more isolated. So there is tons of interest into the science of studying and understanding snake venom, which also happily gives us lots of additional information about the evolution of snake venom. Yes. But enough about snakes. I don't know about that. I think it's time we bring things back on course <laughs> with my next bit of news, which is about giant dwarf crocodiles. And that's all the time we have for the news today. <laughs> I, there's no escaping it. After this, we're talking about phytosaurs. Oh, yeah. It's, it's crocs all the way down. Yep. But I'm going to say that giant dwarf crocodiles. Yes. Is the subject of this next <laughs> news. Which may sound like an oxymoron. I saw this uh, <laughs> headline for this news article on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And the comments on Facebook on any science news article are always, uh, uh, I'll call it a delight. Yeah. Which yeah. is a word that is not accurate. <laughs> uh, it was a bunch of people commenting on that exact yep. <laughs> contradiction. Yes. These are giant members of the group that includes today's dwarf crocodile. So they're not crocodiles that live out in space creating magic hammers using the energy of a neutron star? <laughs> <I guess. laughs> they are not. They are not. But they are pretty cool. This is research by Christopher Brochu et al. Ah, we know that guy. Yep. In the anatomical record. And the article is a press release by the University of Iowa and Eureka Alert. So this research is describing two new species of osteolamine crocodilids, which osteolamus is the genus of today's West African dwarf crocodile. Uh, so dwarf crocodile is the species. Yes. The, the dwarf crocodile. Exactly. And I do believe there are two species nowadays, though I think one is like, eh, uh, sure. It's, it's that questionable taxonomy that plagues all of crocodilia. <laughs> osteolamus is our dwarf crocodile today. The osteolamines are cousins, are other members within this group, but today we only have the dwarf crocodile. These species are from the early or early middle Miocene, so 15 or 18 million years old. These species are Kinyang Maboko Insis and Kinyang Chernavai. These come from the West African Rift Valley system, which is an area that crocodile fossils are very well known from. Yeah. Also, living crocodiles, I would imagine. Absolutely. But a lot of our knowledge of crocs in this area doesn't go back much past 7 million years old. Okay. So we have a good understanding of recent croc fossils, fo fossil groups and the modern groups that are still there. So through the Pliocene and Pleistocene, we see tons of diverse crocs, uh, way more than there are today. There were actually gharials and other groups of like what they call the sharp-nosed crocodiles. Mesotops, Ooh. which is the slender snout croc of today. Nice. Just stabbing fish with its nose. You also had other osteolamines. The 
euthycodons, which were described in this as tubular rostrine. <laughs> with their long tongues coming out to slurp up ants. With, with their, yeah, their snout. So longa rostrine means long skinny snout when we describe it in Crocs. Right. Tubular rostrine they are describing because these have like long chopstick snouts, just like long tube mouths. Huh. It's very, very elongated, but not the super narrow of a gharial. It's it's very weird. <laughs> as well as crocodilus, you know, actual uh, are modern just crocodiles. But before that, in the earlier Miocene, early middle, middle Miocene, we see still euth- euthycodons and gharials, but we're missing a lot of the other sh- shapes and sizes of crocs and groups. And we don't have a full record there. So it's been questions as to why is it so different. One of the, there is an osteolamine still that is brochucus. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> that is a small, uh, short snouted, like two and a half meter, you know, so at five, six foot, you know, six, seven foot croc. But there's none of the big bodied crocodilus, like the Nile croc size. There's none of those large bodied top predator ones. These two, though, seem to fill that role. Oh, so they're filling gotcha. in a gap that was that noted. expected to have something in that ecological space. Precisely. From, among crocodilians, and we didn't have one. Yes. So these two new crocs are not huge. They're ranging like up to 12 feet long. All right, big enough. But big enough to be top predators. Three, four meters. They also have robust skulls. Uh, which would have been good for taking down decent and varied prey. Yeah, sturdy, heavily built skulls. Beefy, you might say. Indeed. They were described as having broad, short, deep snouts, as in tall heads. So not flattened like an alligator's, but fairly tall. One note that uh, I liked in the paper is that the genus is partially diagnosed. One of the diagnostic features is a overbite, that the the top's jaw overbites a bit. Their nostrils are also interesting because instead of pointing straight up on the top of the snout like today's crocodiles do, they're slightly forward. Hmm. Still still toward the top of the snout, but not pointing upwards. This suggests that they may have been spending less time ambushing from the water and more time foraging in, in the underbrush of the forest that they lived in. Interesting. Which is a behavior we see in today's dwarf crocs. Oh, cool. That they are also considered a very terrestrial group. This may be part of the reason we don't have them anymore. This group disappeared about 15 million years ago toward the end of the Miocene climactic optimum, which is a period in time where we saw a number of climactic and weather and and habitat changes, one of which being that there was a decrease in the rainfall, which reduced forested environments and made way for grassland environments. Which, if these were indeed forest-dwelling crocs, Mm -hmm. would have reduced their habitat. And today's Osteolamus is a forest-dwelling specific croc. Yeah. So it may be why they died out. Uh, It still leaves us with about a 7 million year gap between then and when we see our more modern assemblage of crocs and our more recognized assemblage. But this does fill in a little bit of that ecological question as to why are we missing large you know, more more heavily built crocs. Yeah, and in, indeed that we weren't missing them from the ecosystems. We were just missing them from the fossil record. Yes. Until now. <laughs> I, it's interesting uh, that you can call something a giant dwarf crocodile, and it reminds me of a handful of the gray fossil site animals where we have red pandas. And red pandas, today there is a species called red pandas. Mm-hmm. And they are in their own family, a Luridae which has inherited the name of the red panda family. So when we find an extinct species in that family, they are ancient red pandas. Yes. Despite us having no evidence that they were red. Yeah. They could have been brown red pandas. That's the name of the group. Yes. Similarly, our teleoceros, uh, teleoceros has sometimes been called plains rhinos. Ours was thus a forest dwelling plains rhino. (laughs) If you call them that. So Osteolemus and its relatives are... The dwarf crocodiles, so you can get a giant dwarf crocodile because common names are silly. Yes, that's why throughout the paper they mostly call them osteolemines. Yes, instead of saying 
dwarf crocodiles. Yes. Because, no, a 12-foot croc does not count as a dwarf no. crocodile. <laughs> uh, Brochu made the point that this would have been one of the biggest predators that our ancestors in Africa would have had to deal with. <laughs> right. This also raises the possibility that you could get dwarf dwarf crocodiles. Yes. Uh, they little little three foot long. Just, just a just tiny little. <laughs> Perfect for cuddling. <laughs> <laughs> well, enough about crocs. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about not quite crocs. All right. Phytosaurs. Slowly, slowly distancing ourselves on our way towards snake mode. I got to wean myself off. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I don't want to pull anything. Right, no, you gotta go, so you only get the bends. Yes. <laughs> After this break, let's talk about phytosaurs and what exactly is a phytosaur and how are they not quite crocs. Phytosaurs are one of the well-known groups from the late Triassic. So Triassic being the first period of the Mesozoic. Roughly 250 to 200 million years ago. This was a group of reptiles that were effectively worldwide. Uh, Definitely more common in some parts of Pangaea at the time, so the supercontinent that made up all the land masses. Hey, episode 141. They are extremely well known across the world. They're found on every continent, minus Antarctica and Australia. They're definitely known more from the Laurasian, so the northern portion of Pangaea, uh, especially abundant here in North America. But they are found across Europe and Asia as well. In the what was Gondwana land masses, they have been found from Morocco and South Africa and India. But, for instance, the first mainland sub-Saharan African phytosaur to be found was in 2020. Oh, wow. So, like, the very recent, they are much more well-known from the northern hemisphere, specifically the land masses that were the northern section of Pangaea. This group is famous, though, for being very croc-like. Yeah, basically crocs. They, they look so almost uncannily croc-like. Yes, this this isn't like when you see an ichthyosaur and it's like, yeah, that's the fish lizard. And it's like, yeah, it, it is shaped like a fish. Yeah. But it doesn't take much scrutiny to identify that that's not actually a fish. Yeah, if we this put one of them. reptile mm-hmm. that is shaped like a fish. Phytosaurs, if there was one outside your window, you'd just think it was a croc. Yes. Like, if you did not take a close look, or even if you did, depending on how well a, <laughs> an angle you had to look at it from... They are extremely croc-like. Low slung bodies, you know, close to the ground, long body shape with a long tail, short, what seemed to be splayed limbs, so their legs were out to the side from what we can tell, based on their pelvic and shoulder structure. An armored body with osteoderms, just like the armored bodies of crocs today and in the past, as well as a long, narrow face, a skull and snout that are elongated, full of conical teeth. Yep. Croc. Very, very croc-shaped. Now, they do have some unique features that really set them apart as a group and are unique to phytosaurs. For instance, their osteoderms. Uh, they typically have a few different kinds of osteoderms that are noted. Triangular ones that are on the back, but then they also will have osteoderms on the limbs, you know, covering their arms and legs. They also have a special structure called a guler shield, which is a throat patch of osteoderms that covers the underside of their throat, uh, which is unique among archosauriforms. And archosaurs are the group that include today's crocs, birds, dinosaurs, pterosaurs, and phytosaurs. We'll get into how how much it includes (laughs) phytosaurs. Yeah, because this is a note that we're going to get into uh, here in a little bit. The, the reason it's so weird that phytosaurs look so darn much like crocs is because they're not. Yes. And they're not even that close. No, they are a very distinct group. They are very much their own creatures. For instance, their long face, though looks very croc-like, is made up slightly differently. Uh, in most animals' faces, when you think of it, the part that has the teeth on your skull, most of it is what's called the maxilla. 
for a lot of, for, this is very common structure that you have a long maxilla full of teeth and then the front right under your nose it's the bone that makes up the bottom of most nostrils is the premaxilla which on today's crocs is very small and it's just the tip of the snout right you see this in a lot of dinosaurs in a lot of other reptiles crocs do this snakes do this lizards do this where the bone that holds most of the teeth on the top of the jaw, left and right, that's the maxillary bone that has the tooth sockets or the tooth space. And then you might have a couple bones on the premaxilla way up at the front. Uh, some lizards will have uh, bones, more more teeth on the roof of the mouth. Yes. But your maxilla, that is the bone that holds our upper teeth. Yes. Is our maxillary bone. With phytosaurs, most of their tooth bearing is on the premaxilla. They, so it's it's the, it's the tip of the snout bone has just been extended to make up most of that snout. Yes, and the maxilla is fairly short. Weird. Still, you know, there. It's still present, but it is not the majority of the teeth. This is partially because and makes way for the weirdest feature of phytosaurs, which is where their nose is. Their nostrils are not at the tip of the snout like most vertebrates, especially your long-snouted vertebrate. Yeah, if you think about a dog or a crocodile, animals with long snouts, the nostrils are way at the end. Yes. These nostrils are right up in front of the eyes, almost between the eyes on some (laughs) of them, on the top of the skull. If you picture those old artworks of like Brachiosaurus, which had its little helmet snout, the mm-hmm. nostrils on that crest above their eyes. That's kind of what phytosaurs have going on. Yeah, those sauropod dinosaurs, incidentally, did, probably did not have their external nostrils up there. Yeah, no, that's an old the, interpretation. That's where the narrow, narrow openings are in the skull. But more recent interpretations have that the nostrils themselves would have been down at the snout where they belong. Yeah. Instead of being up there between the eyes. Yes. With phytosaurs, they are right in front of the orbits. That is by far the easiest thing to distinguish them from crocs. Like today we have the advice that if it has an overbite, it's an alligator. The teeth in our lock, it's a crocodile. Or if it's a U-shaped snout, it's an alligator. Or an V-shaped snout, it's a crocodile. If the noses are near the eyes, it's a phytosaur. If it's at the tip, it's a crocodilian. (laughs) This is also a handy distinguisher for when you're looking at the skull of a phytosaur or a croc, that the nose openings are going to be on opposite sides of the skull. And if you're looking for those bone sutures, one bone is cut, stretching out for most of that upper snout, that premaxilla. Yes. Which is a fascinating difference because it demonstrates how you can get similar structures even with a fundamentally different underlying skeletal plan. Absolutely. That like the, the thing that distinguishes phytosaurs from true crocs is that their skulls are fundamentally not built the same way. Even though they are built in the same shape. Oh, yeah. Like, when you have a croc skull and a phytosaur skull next to each other, they are going to look very similar. But if you take those skulls apart into their individual bones, they stop looking like each other incredibly quickly. Yeah, which is so cool. They also have interesting teeth. Uh, They have some differentiation to the teeth throughout their mouth. So they are heterodont very often with different shaped teeth in different parts of the mouth. Mm -hmm. And we'll get into more detail on that later. Uh, Many of them also have serrations on their teeth, uh, which, as their croc shape has already probably indicated for many people, supports that they are carnivorous. Yes. These are predatory animals as a group. We don't have any evidence of uh, herbivorous phytosaurs. Potentially there were omnivorous, but we don't, I've never seen any discussion of non-carnivorous phytosaurs. They are also often reconstructed as semi-aquatic, and there is support for that in a number of cases that we'll go into. Not only does that make sense just because they look like a croc, but we find them in often aquatic-associated fossil deposits. And these were extremely capable predators. They got medium to large-sized. Most of the larger phytosaurs I was able to find like in research discussions got up to 20 feet you know, so at that point, six meters or yeah, so, six, seven meters. But there are phytosaurs that are noted to get up to 10 or and I've seen 12 meters listed multiple times in scientific papers. Wow. Some phytosaurs got incredibly big, which means that they occupied not only the same shapes as crocs, but the same size ranges. Yes. Like the biggest modern crocs are about six meters, 20 feet long. 
and the biggest ancient crocs were significantly longer than that. Exactly. I could not find, like, specifically which species or specimen gave that 12 meter, Mm. but I did find some findings of extremely large skulls. Now, very often, phytosaur skulls are partial. You know, they're broken and we're missing sections of them. And, for instance, there was one skull that I was placed, at least at the time of that paper, in Redondosaurus. The partial skull was 780 millimeters or two and a half feet. Wow. Estimated that the whole skull would have been... 1200 millimeters four feet long wow that's a lot of skull the largest croc skulls we have in the fossil record are two meters six feet long Mm -hmm. that's dinosuchus and sarcosuchus and purusaurus this is getting up to those very largest sizes crocodilians have ever reached so phytosaurs were large likely apex dominant predators during the late triassic yeah and they were doing this all in in the late triassic yes so not like they achieved this over the course of many tens of millions of years like crocs did this is a much more time restricted group absolutely nonetheless achieved this size variation globally diverse large dominant predators they did the croc thing before crocs and Yes, quite a bit before crocs, about 100 million years before crocs were doing the croc thing. Now, there were other members in the crocodilomorph group during the Triassic, uh, but at that time, they were not shaped how we perceive crocs to be shaped. No. There were not semi-aquatic ambush hunting crocs at that time. That slot seems to have potentially been filled by phytosaurs. Yeah, the world of the late Triassic is that pre- age of dinosaurs age of reptiles time period where you've got some of the earliest dinosaurs but most dinosaurs are relatively small you've got the start of your big things like platyosaurus and then you've got all these other archosaurs running around your early croc cousins your bipedal running around things your armored edosaurs your predatory rawasukians but not really true crocs not most of the familiar dinosaurs. This is a proto age of reptiles as we typically think of it. Yeah, it's age of reptiles round one. Yes. While the Jurassic and Cretaceous feel much more like a continuing of a theme over the two, Triassic really does set apart. Now, the comparison with crocodilians has both been supported and kind of critiqued because sometimes that comparison can be taken too far. Uh, Mm -hmm. where it is assumed, well, you're shaped like a croc. Ergo, we can just make you behave like a croc when we picture how you would be living. Right. We can figure it out. We got all the biology. We know it. We just just take the croc outline and the the instruction sheet of being a croc (laughs) and just apply it to a phytosaur. And it's been made that they are different, but there are absolutely convergences that seem to be supported by research. One recent study, a 2019, which I think is still being weighted to be peer-reviewed, but was looking at where is the convergence between the slender-snouted phytosaurs and slender-snouted crocs of today, and did find that structurally they do seem to be similar in their the mechanisms, the mechanics of their bite ability. Uh, though, in every comparison, crocs had a stronger and more resistant bite force hmm. than the phytosaurs. So there is comparison there, but it's not a one-to-one. They don't just have identical bites according to that early research. Uh, There is, though, some similarity to their brain shapes, which I found very interesting. Oh, weird. (laughs) They did neural scans for the endocast, the endocranial shape that would give you an idea of how the brain would be shaped, and found that phytosaurs in general are united by elongated olfactory bulbs for smelling for smelling episode 130 which we also see in crocodilians yeah that makes sense yep you're both navigating by smell a lot you've both got long snouts with lots of room for scent real estate yep so there is some convergence and similarities in the neural aspects of these two groups cool and and this is a a thing they share in the fact that neither of them have it (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the vomeral nasal organ. Oh, yeah. The Jacobson's organ, which we talked about in our evolution of scent. Yep, in episode 130. That's the organ, for example, that snakes are using when they do the tongue flick thing, and that horses are using when they do that weird horse face. Yes. The reason this came up is because it was considered for a time that phytosaurs might have Jacobson's organs, because mm-hmm. they have depressions 
in the bone in the similar spot that the Jacobson organ, the vomeral nasal organ, would be expected. Okay. But when they looked at croc skulls, similar impressions in the similar area of the skull are not from the vomeral nasal. They are associated with cerebral tissue, specifically from the ophthalmic nerve, because crocs don't have a Jacobson's organ. Mm -hmm. Uh, And as far as we know, that's not an archosaur feature. Birds don't have it. It's never been proposed for other archosaurs. So that similarity led most people to put aside the hypothesis that Phytosaurus had one because it doesn't seem like that indentation is a good implication of a Jacobson's organ. Now that is taking Phytosaurus and Crocs and comparing them very directly. But based on that, regardless, Phytosaurs are definitely related to Archosaurs, even if they're not in the group Archosaurs, which we'll get into, that it doesn't seem like there's a lot of support for it. So the comparison between Crocs and Phytosaurs is a very interesting one that continues into other aspects of their lifestyle. And so we will be discussing it throughout the episode. But there are similarities, but there are also cautions to over comparing them. Right. Now let's talk their taxonomy really quick since we've mentioned their relation to Archosaur as a group. Right. A couple of times. So archosaurs, as a refresher for our uh, fans out there, as you mentioned before, crocs, birds, dinosaurs, pterosaurs, and a bunch of those early Triassic things, as opposed to the other major group of reptiles, lepidosaurs, which includes lizards and snakes, and their various offshoots and cousins like mosasaurs and plesiosaurs, and so on. Absolutely. So phytosauria, within which is phytosauridae, is considered pretty consistently a monophyletic, a true group. You know, so that group is solid. One evolutionary origin that gave rise to all the things we call phytosaurs. This group is denoted by having at least six premaxillary teeth, uh, longer premaxilla than maxilla. That's a feature of this group Mm -hmm. a lot of the time. That, as they put it, non-terminal nares. It's not at the end of the snout. (laughs) And they're heterodont teeth. So a lot of the things that set them out from Crocs is also what identifies this group. Cool. Within which at least 30 species have been identified. But the organization of this group and where this group falls on the reptile evolutionary tree has been adjusted and reevaluated many, many times. Classically, phytosaurs were grouped as early branching pseudosuchians. So some of the earliest, not quite crocs, croc cousins. That's what pseudosuchia, pseudo, not, it means not true. Right. Pseudosuchia is the group that include eventually includes true crocs. Yep. And all of their various crocodilla morph, crocodilla form cousins. This was based off of their croc-like ankles, uh, the crudotarsal ankles. These are very characteristic of the Sukian group. The crocodilla forms have pretty consistent ankle morphology. And one of the things that's special about that is it allows them to do that high walk, to go from a very lizard arms to the side to a almost dinosaur arms under the body walk. Phytosaurs have very similar ankle morphology, as well as other cranial and postcranial elements that seem to lean that way. But in 2011 is really the key turning point. A reanalysis of archosauriforms was done and found that those characters are not actually as diagnostic they're not as actually descriptive as was previously thought they are spread broadly across archosauria and therefore their distribution you know their presence in a group really can't determine a lot Mm. so the features that were used to place them with crocs turned out to not actually be that specific not to crocs just kind of archosaur in general and not really that characteristic so the new placement for Phytosauria is that it is a sister taxon to Archosauria. Okay, so not actually within true Archosaurs yes. alongside Crocs and Dinos, but a more distant cousin to that whole group. Yeah, they'll often be described as Archosauriforms. They are mm-hmm. Archosaur-like. They're Ar- very Archosauroids. close. Archosauroids. Yes. Archosaurish. Yes. <laughs> Which means now, instead of bracketing, you know, instead of being placed within the crocs and their cousins, they're placed within between archosaurs and lepidosaurs. Right. 
So they are with often compared between those two main branches of reptiles. This confusion also extends within Phytosauria in that multiple species you will find archaic genus names. Mm -hmm. That the genus and species, the species name typically sticks. So Gregori is a common, is a name that you'll see. But it was at one point Rutitidon Gregori and then Smilosuchus Gregori. I think that's the most recent. Mm -hmm. Uh, But you will find multiple phytosaurs that sometimes you'll see it listed in a, a description that's a decade old now. And it has a different name, but is describing the same phytosaur that you'll see with a new name on wikipedia or some other source right because they, their taxonomy keeps getting shuffled and revised yes so that it, it can be confusing uh, i had a number of times where something would be like one of the biggest phytosaurs is this one and i go all right let's copy paste that and google that and not much would come up and then i'd find another one talking about another big species and it took me a second to realize they had the both had the same species name but different <laughs> genus so the taxonomy is shifting quite regularly, uh, so I can't really give an overview of it because I could not find, like, here, right. here and, is a reliable... Phytosaurs. <laughs> yes. Phytosaurs, 30 species of various groupings. Evolutionarily, there's also some very interesting uh, questions that we're still trying to answer. Phytosaurs as a group are basically just known from the late Triassic. They hit their peak from... 230 to 200 million years ago. That is when phytosaurs really became dominant. Uh, I saw it as near Pangean distri- distribution, cool. which is a great term. But when you time calibrate their evolutionary tree, it suggests that they really should have or- originated in the early Triassic. Like mm-hmm. our estimates place their origins at toward the beginning of the Triassic, shortly after the Permian extinction. Right. Given how much diversity there is by the late Triassic, you can infer that that diversification started earlier in the early Triassic. Absolutely. The the current estimates are, are hypothesized divergent between archosaurs and phytosaurs is 247 million years old. Right at the start of the Triassic. Right there. But there have not really been any phytosaur remains older than 232 million years old. Uh, There were some, but we don't currently have them. The holotype skull of Mesorhinosuchus was stratigraphically the lowest phytosaur, the earliest phytosaur. This was described in 1910 and found from early Triassic German fossil deposits and would absolutely have helped fill in that earlier phytosaur evolutionary information, except it was lost in World War II. Mm. and destroyed utterly, and no casts remain. I wonder if it was stored in the same museum as those early Spinosaurus remains yeah, we I talked about in episode 42. I didn't find out if what the details... it was in details, Germany, yeah, I think that's where Spinosaurus was. That was my thoughts. Yep! Uh, there were also some middle Triassic uh, phytosaur limb elements from Germany that since then have been dismissed mm. uh, diagnostically. As, as not definitively phytosaurus. Exactly. So... There have been fossils in the past earlier that, that fill in our gap a bit, but we don't currently have them or they have since been determined not to be phytosaur. I think I remember a study from a few years ago of what was thought to be a middle Triassic phytosaur that ended up being re-identified as a different type of reptile. Yes. So stuff like that has happened multiple times. Which leaves us with this gap. About 15 million years. Early phytosaur evolution. So currently the oldest Phytosaurs typically that you'll see referenced are from the late Triassic already. We have multiple of earliest, oldest phytosaurs from across the world. There's ones from Morocco, from Europe, from Germany. Many of these are Paleorhinus, ancient snout, or ancient nose is what that means, <laughs> which I think may now be Parasuchus. Uh, I've seen it; those names compared with an equal sign put between them in many papers yes. that... This name basically means that name. Yeah, we've synonymized them. We've synonymized them. But you'll often see Paleorhinus as the earliest phytosaurs until just a few years ago, 2017, a ancient Triassic reptile from the Middle Triassic was re-identified as phytosaur. This is Diendongosuchus from the Middle Triassic of China. 
uh, and is currently considered the oldest and most basal phytosaur. So you remember when I said that I remembered a study that yeah. it was a phytosaur that was re-identified as something different? This is what I was thinking of, so I had it backwards. <laughs> yep, yep, there you go. <laughs> That's the name that was in my head. This was originally identified as something else and re-identified as phytosaur. Yeah, it was originally identified as a papasaur, which is a papasaurid, which is a, I, I believe those are crocodile forms are close to. It's much more closer to the croc lineage and a true archosaur. But in 2017, it was re-identified. Now, part of the reason for this initial misidentification is it does not look like a phytosaur. This mm. has a caiman face. Weird. It's got a short premaxilla, nose at the front of the snout, and a very triangular shaped head, like a very typical croc shaped head. So it's missing a lot of the diagnostic phytosaurian head features, but analysis of the whole specimen has placed it within phytosauria, which reduces that gap by to 10 million years of we don't know instead of 15 million years, so that's great. It also shows us that early phytosaurs did not look like typical phytosaurs, very likely. That that, sh that skull with the nose up toward the eyes might be the more derived shape that happened later in phytosaur evolution. It's hard to know since we only have one specimen. This could be the weirdo. Right. Or it could be awaiting another reevaluation. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, but currently this is considered the oldest and most basal phytosaur and suggests that early phytosaurs may have looked like more typical archosaurs with a with a normal face. Interesting. Which is good information because it gives us an idea of what to look for mm -hmm. when looking for early phytosaur fossils. Absolutely. There's also some interesting debate about the youngest phytosaurs. So phytosaurs in general are considered to be a Triassic group that they die out alongside a bunch of other Triassic groups at the end Triassic extinction. Episode 15. But there are some debated specimens and bits of evidence of phytosaurs that make it into the very earliest Jurassic. Oh. Many of these have been refuted since they were originally suggested, but there are some others that are just not strong enough for everyone to agree, but are still kind of floating around yeah, if you if you go Googling it or searching for it in the literature, you'll find these names. Absolutely. There was one uh, partial mandible from the UK that makes it into the earliest Jurassic, but this is one of those where the stratigraphy, the dating of the deposit, is a little fuzzy, mm. and it's an incredibly fragmented specimen. So a big old maybe. So that's a big old maybe. There's also isolated teeth from France that make it into the Jurassic, that look very phytosaur, but a lot of people have basically said, yeah, but these are cone teeth. Right. Which is shaped like just a ton of other Jurassic crocodiliforms who also had cone teeth and were definitely around at this time. So... So a maybe. Can we say phytosaur from just teeth? You know, so there's been some people who've cautioned using teeth to establish the presence of this group. Uh, there was even one case of... Pachysuchus in the early Jurassic that was a misidentified sauropodomorph, it seems. Oops. So there's also been misidentification of material. So there's some evidence for them, some groups surviving for only the briefest times. None of these were like mid-Jurassic. They were always just the very earliest Jurassic. Mm -hmm. So maybe some groups of phytosaurs made it through that extinction, but so far... The consensus says that, nope, they made it to the end of the Triassic and died out along with many other Triassic groups. But we're still learning. This all makes phytosaurs a very interesting group of extinct animals to talk about because they are such a narrow group. Absolutely. And an old group that we don't know. What, you know, we've done episodes about groups that are relatively narrow in time. Like we did Ceratopsians and we did Tyrannosaurs, which are basically all late Cretaceous with some earlier discussion, but phytosaurs are this narrow group with not much known about their early history and not a whole lot known about their specific extinction, which nonetheless were extremely widespread. And I think what's interesting about them beyond that is that they seem so familiar and the fact that, as we just discussed, they probably aren't on the croc lineage and possibly not even true archosaurs, but near archosaurs, 
makes it that much more impressive how similar they evolved to look and presumably behave somewhat like Crocs. Mm -hmm. That this isn't like, oh yeah, well they were they were related and that might explain some of those similarities. No, no, this was a much more distinct group, which not only makes phytosaurs seem more impressive in my mind, but also makes the general croc body shape seem more impressive. Yeah, yeah. But this is something that has shown up multiple times among distantly related groups. Absolutely. Yeah, phytosaurs have so many odd features in that they are one of the best known Triassic groups. Mm -hmm. Like, they are incredibly well known, so much so that they are often index fossils. Like, if you find a phytosaur, very often that is used to indicate you're in the late Triassic. That's how characteristic of this age they are. But it's still the Triassic, so we still are missing just tons of information. And we still have all these fragmentary fossils and inferences, because it's still really old. And then, yeah, they're familiar, but also weird. So they've got all these contradicting situations that (laughs) makes them fascinating. Very interesting group. So that gives you an idea of what phytosaurs are you know scientifically as how we understand them as a group and in their age but let's talk a little bit more about what they were like as animals how was a phytosaur behaving surviving and living after the break I thought we'd start with the diet of phytosaurs because their presence in the Triassic as top predators is often one of the most discussed features of this group. Uh, And it's one of my favorite things. So, you know. Well, yeah. And that's it's one of the cool things to talk about about crocs. Yes. So that's where you go. It's why I like predators. (laughs) Phytosaurs are undoubtedly carnivorous that they they were absolutely predatory i saw one paper that said despite their name yes <laughs> they, they are predators phytos or fight comes from plant yep the plant lizard <laughs> yes uh, i don't remember why was that a tooth thing i couldn't i, I didn't find anything that mentioned that uh, i think there was a, an early misunder misinterpretation of them as herbivorous or something that led to the name plant lizard yeah and phytosaur. i don't, that could be because i think early early on they were sometimes grouped closely to adosaurs mm. which are thought to be herbivorous uh croc cousins crocodilomorphs yeah yeah uh so one way or the other they were given the name plant lizard and it's stuck because of that's how taxonomy works yep and boy is it wrong oh yeah they're not they have nothing to do with plants there's tons of evidence for the fact that these were predators on the body just straightforward sharp teeth mm-hmm. big long snout you don't typically need a super long face to handle plants in fact you typically want a short stout powerful face to grind through plants sharp sharp teeth some of which were serrated yeah which is almost universally a predator feature theropods uh saber-tooth cats (laughs) yeah uh monitor lizards so they're shaped to be to be taking down meat also evidence of their muscular structure uh reconstructions of what their muscles might have been like supports adaptations for handling a large skull which makes sense they've got large skulls but also fast closure of the jaw Mm -hmm. so snapping their mouth shut really quick so their muscles also seem to indicate mouths that were good for catching prey it's also been interpreted that they likely were employing a similar mostly submerged in the water hunting and hiding strategy as crocs do considering that most of their armored osteoderms are along the back Mm -hmm. And their eyes and nose are on the top of the head. Yes, elevated, just like in crocs, so that they can sit mostly submerged. And still see and smell and breathe. Their teeth are also complex uh, for especially your early reptilian predators. Like, we tend to think of a lot of them having very sameish teeth throughout the mouth. Phytosaurs are known to be heterodont, different groups of teeth throughout the mouth. Typically with at least three distinct sets. Uh, at least along the top of the jaw, and two typically on the mandible, on the lower jaw. 
For many of them, the tip of the snout has long fang-like teeth, you know, long and sharp. Behind that, they go from cone-shaped to more, they describe that as D-shaped and bicarinate, multiple, multiple pointed toward the back of the premaxilla. And then in the maxilla, you have stout and conical teeth that go to triangular flanged teeth. So fairly complex tooth structure, all of which fit very well for a predatory lifestyle. There's been differentiated functions proposed for each set of teeth, with the front sharp teeth being good for grabbing and even dispatching small prey, you know, just stabbing into them and killing them. The teeth behind that good for seizing and holding on to larger prey potentially, and then the back teeth good for dismembering and processing the meat. There's also a classically held hypothesis for specializations in different prey groups based on the different shapes of snouts and heads that we see in Phytosaurus. Very famously, there are two main morphs that you find in different species of Phytosaurus. They're like, different species tend to fall into one of these two groups. A robust head and a gracile head. The robust skulled Phytosaurus still have a long snout, but it is much taller, a deeper snout. The premaxilla also tends to carry a large crest going from the nose down to the tip of the snout. Just this enlarged, more heavily built face. And the gracile snouts are long and thin, almost identical to today's gharials. Yeah, I was going to say that sounds very similar to what we see in modern crocodilians, where you've got big, broad snouts and long, thin snouts. Absolutely, and that's the comparison that's been made. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, it's often been considered that they filled similar pred predatory roles, as we see in today's crocs with their different snout shapes. That your broad, heavily built heads are much better for generalist and large prey diets, for taking down bigger, more heavily built prey items sometimes skewing toward a terrestrial diet, taking prey from the land. Right. The, like the classic we think of with like a Nile croc grabbing a zebra or something. Exactly. That's kind of the poster child for this skull shape. Mm -hmm. The flip side is the gharial or slender snout shape, where there are multiple slender snouted crocs today, which are typically associated with smaller prey items, often fish. Mm -hmm. These are piscivorous jaws, good for snapping up fish underwater where a thin jaw moves quickly. So that's been proposed for phytosaurs for the longest time, that you can kind of group them. But it's time for me to get on my soapbox when it comes to, on your, to your crock box. my snout-shaped soapbox. There are a number of reasons to be careful about that interpretation for the diets of phytosaurs. One reason is physical evidence. This was one particular study from 2020 on the tooth wear for phytosaurs. Yeah, the, the specific ways the tooth is damaged during feeding, which can tell you things about diet. Absolutely. Looking into five different phytosaur species, they found not a lot of specialization, it seems. There's not a lot of diversity of tooth wear among different shaped phytosaurs hmm. for their different shaped snouts. The tooth wear looks fairly similar. They did find heavier, rougher tooth wear on the robust taxas, gotcha. but they said that that could just be taking larger prey, not necessarily different prey. Right. That you could both be taking fish, but you're just taking bigger fish. Like, this just means you're biting something that you're having to bite a bit more, not necessarily a different group of prey. They also didn't notice a lot of different micro wear between the groups of teeth. So there might not actually be that much specialization as we had initially interpreted from the heterodont dentition. There's definitely some, and it definitely gave us some information. There was a couple that indicated eating harder, like invertebrate prey, mm -hmm. hard-shelled stuff. So it, there was some convergence in tooth wear between them and crocs when they compared it to croc tooth wear studies, but the slender snouts and the robust snouts don't seem to be having distinct diets from one another. Interesting. Which makes you wonder why... They have those different snout shapes, and perhaps they're hunting in different ways, mm -hmm. or perhaps they're living in different parts of the habitat or something like that. Well, and it's especially interesting to me because this same dialogue has happened with modern crocs. Right. There are examples of specialized crocs. The gharial is a fish specialist. But among the slender snout crocs, that's really the only one. 
all the other slender snouts have still an incredibly diverse diet. They're typically taking smaller prey items, Mm -hmm. but you can't say they're fish eaters just because they have skinny snouts. There's the famous uh, study I found of the false gharial where they found monkeys, pigs, and even human remains (laughs) in their stomach contents. The second most slender snouted croc alive today taking down large terrestrial prey. So that is not a one-to-one. No. You can't say slender snout equals fish. So that has been an, a, a tool used against modern crocs quite often, that these snouts eat these things and these snouts eat those things, and it has been shown time and time through observation, studies, and stomach contents not to hold true. It seems that that's probably very much the case for phytosaurs as well, that you can't just say, well, their snout's shaped this way, so they were likely eating these things. Well, mm-hmm. they were probably eating more of those things but they could probably still eat a little bit of whatever they wanted. Right. That's one of the nice things about being croc shaped is that you, you do kind of just get to eat whatever you want. Yeah. There is some direct evidence of this. We do have stomach contents from at least one, a Parasuchus, that had a uh, stomach contents from a archosauromorph called Malarisaurus. These were small, long necked archosauromorphs. It also had partial remains of another archosauromorph called a Rhynchosaur which were herbivorous that had these triangle-shaped heads and beaked snouts, really mm-hmm. cool, weird-looking things. Both decent-sized terrestrial prey items. Yeah, land dwellers. Parasuchus is a very slender-snouted phytosaur, so direct evidence that... They were grabbing stuff off the land. Absolutely. Now, whether they were scavenging these or hunting these, but they were still handling large terrestrial food. Mm-hmm. Now, that's not to say they weren't eating fish, you know, there's still plenty of evidence that they were likely eating fish like today's crocs do. Like, yeah. Well, if you live in and adjacent to the water, uh, that's what you're going to have around to eat. Absolutely. There was at least one coprolite I found that was potentially phytosaur. It has fish scales in it and has evidence of being in a aquatic or near aquatic habitat. So likely a medium-sized carnivore so for the time phytosaur fits that very well mm-hmm. but that that's about that's as close as we get to phytosaur poop right <laughs> and if it is phytosaur poop it's full of fish full of fish we also do get feeding traces we have a couple of instances of feeding traces from what seem to be phytosaurs one was on some prosauropod dinosaurs celosaurus which had one of them bite marks from at least two different predators there seems to be several individuals that chewed on this. Uh, one likely a primitive archosaur, but the other very much seems to be phytosaur. This is partially identifiable because phytosaurs have very particular dentitions. Yeah. So that does help they identify these things. Leave very particular bar- bite marks. Yeah. Now, this is likely scavenging mm-hmm. since there are multiple predatory bite marks on it. Yeah. They um, probably weren't sharing. Yes, exactly. But... This was the earliest evidence. This was from 1998 that this was described. The first evidence of them manipulating large terrestrial prey. Even if it's scavenging, it's still a most likely robust snouted phytosaur taking on terrestrial food. Cool. And then there is the famous study that made all the news rounds in 2014, which was a paracrocodilomorph femur that exhibited... Bite marks. Uh, there was two different femurs. One which showed healed bite marks, likely from another crocodile morph, and this one which showed four unhealed bite marks that seem they have that D-shaped structure seem to be phytosaur, and indicates either that they did not survive the bite because they don't show any sign of healing, or was already dead, mm-hmm. and this was another scavenging event. But this is an indication of phytosaurs eating large predatory crocodilomorphs, paracrocodilomorphs. Uh, So they were absolutely top predators, and we have some decent evidence about what they were eating, but there's also some assumptions about their diets that have been around for a very long time, and you'll still see pop up, that a number of people have kind of come out to be like, well, that doesn't even hold true for the crocs you're comparing them to. Right. Let alone can we make that assumption just based off the shape of the skull. So... Still lots of information and and details to parse out there. I have a question for you as a croc expert. Yup. In your professional opinion, do you think phytosaurs would have death rolled? I don't know. I don't think so because one of the features that separates them from crocs is they lack a secondary palate. 
Uh, mm. And so the secondary palate is the roof of the croc's mouth that separates the inside of the mouth from the inside of the nostrils. Right. It is convergent with our secondary palate. That's what we have. Yes. That's why when you breathe in your nose, it doesn't, the air just doesn't go directly into your mouth. Well, it's why you can like take a drink of water and, and take a breath and like eat and breathe at the same time. Yes. It's not going to mix with your airways every time. Phytosaurs lack that. They do have a, I think a secondary, uh, or, or something that's convergent in the premaxilla that does some of the same structural Right, like a partial secondary palate. Yeah. I think I remember reading about that at some point. But I don't know that they had the same stress resistances to being able to twist the skull, mm. uh, especially since their skulls are much taller than they are flat. Yeah. So I don't know that they'd be as efficient at doing that. It might be too much stress. That's a lot of axial torsion. You know, that's a lot of twisting yeah. on your face. All right. So yeah, I don't know. Uh they also often had serrated teeth, so they might not have needed to well, death that's roll. that's true. They could have sliced through them. They wouldn't have to tear it apart yeah. the same way crocs do. They were likely more efficient biters in that they took chunks of meat easier than a croc would. All right. I'd assume. Well, someday, if we find a Triassic archosauriform whose body is twisted a bunch, <laughs> <laughs> we can infer a death roll. Yes. Now, speaking of those snouts, there is a different interpretation to why there are two different shapes of phytosaur snout. And it has nothing to do with feeding strategies. There have been hypotheses that maybe what we're seeing are sexually dimorphic morphs of a singular species. Oh, because, different sexes. Yes, because quite often when you find a deposit with phytosaurs in it, you'll find a robust and a gracile londorostrine taxa. There will be a heavy-headed and a thin-snouted phytosaur in many environments. Like, this is f a regular occurring feature of phytosaur uh, deposits. And so it's been proposed, well, maybe we don't have two species. Maybe we have a male, a big, robust, robust heavy male with a crest on the premaxilla mm -hmm. that is much more notable in the robust skulls, and then a less robust skulled female who they will still often have uh, crests, but not nearly as exaggerated as the robust head. And their snouts tend to be the same length. Mm -hmm. They're just not the same thickness, not the same uh, thin versus heavy. Interesting. That would also be consistent with uh, the potential evidence that their diets were not significantly different. Exactly. That this is the same species eating very similar things, just with different skull shapes for a different reason. Exactly. So there's been multiple studies proposing this for specific sites and specific deposits of phytosaurs, but there have also been a number of reanalyses that have kind of thrown a wrench into it, you know, where the dating of the site turns out that these two stratigraphic levels where the fossils were found are actually not co-occurring. Mm, so they didn't live at the same time. Yeah, and, and that would make it difficult if one of you is a male and one of you is a female. <laughs> yes, that would, that would really be a problem for the species. So there's been instances of that. Uh, there have been other instances where what we thought were closely related, robust and thin-snouted taxas, turn out to actually not seem to be that related. So really, it's probably also not likely that they're the same species. Mm. So there's, it's still being debated, but it, it has been proposed and it is a regular topic of discussion among phytosaur research. Yeah. As we've discussed before, it is extremely difficult to identify sexual dimorphism in the fossil record. Absolutely. So this, this is a proposal for why we see two distinct morphs so regularly, but I haven't seen anything that is like a, I haven't seen anything else reference one of these studies to be like, and, and now we know this. To, mm -hmm. But I have seen at least three different studies that I came across saying, like, here's evidence. Here, this We think this provides solid evidence. Interesting. Well, and it wouldn't be surprising if it wasn't sexual dimorphism because finding multiple body types of the same group of animals in an ecosystem ecologically differentiated is still pretty common today. Oh, yeah. That happens among crocs where we all have mm -hmm. a thin-snouted, smaller species and a broad-headed larger species or sometimes the reverse where you have a thick-headed smaller species and a thin-snouted larger <laughs> species but different head shapes overlapping it's not often that you have similarly shaped crocs occupying the same habitats so it would be it, it makes total biological sense 
for that to be either ecological differentiation or sexual dimorphism, depending on what is borne out by the fossil evidence, which it sounds like ecological differentiation is probably more likely. Yes. Another thing that's been under research with phytosaurs is their habitat and how they get around. It has often been proposed that they are semi-aquatic because of their crocky like shape. Living in fresh water or shallow water, hanging out by the edge, waiting for a dinosaur to walk by or a fish to swim by and grab it. And there's plenty of evidence for that. Many, the majority of phytosaur fossils are found in what seem to be fluvial deposits. So river and lake basin type deposits. There's also plenty of anatomical evidence. Their tails seem like they are good for swimming. Mm -hmm. They have the same like body and foot structure as a crocodile, which the reason crocodiles are shaped that way is because it's good for swimming and then walking to another body of water. Yeah. You already mentioned that the nose and eyes are elevated on top of the head, which we see not only in crocs, but like hippos have that. Mm -hmm. There are salamanders that do that. But some of the depictions that hadn't been classically considered is there is actually also evidence that they were marine, that there were marine phytosaurs. Ocean dwelling. Yes, at least coastal, but potentially even like facultative, like they spent majority of their time out in salt water. Most of the genus that are found from marine deposits, which is one of the biggest pieces of evidence that they're found from what seems to be a salt water sediment, are typically referred to the genus Mystriosuchus. These are often found to be around four meters long. 12, 12 to 15 feet. So decent sized. Uh, there was one paper that described, I think, a few individuals that were that size, and the histology indicated they were not yet full grown. <laughs> uh, that they were still probably growing. So these could get up to 20 feet. You know, these could get much bigger potentially. Their postcranial anatomy really suggests heavily aquatic lifestyles, much more so than other phytosaurs. So that these might have been. Not maybe not quite as marine as the famous marine crocs, right? The metriorhynchids, which yeah. were ocean crocs, or even ba the... basically mosasaur crocs. So maybe if you think more of the teleosaurs, which were in the same overall group as the metriorhynchids, but look just like a croc with a really long face mm -hmm. and really really good at swimming, but so, they still had feet, they still had hands, right? Like an otter. Yeah, so yeah, you're real good in the water, but you don't, you know, you can come walk around. You can get out of the pool when you choose. Some of the indications that give us this idea. They had shorter, slightly more paddle-like fins, so maybe better for maneuvering in the water. They also only tend to have two types of osteoderms instead of the three, typically known from other phytosaurs, so less heavily armored, which is also a feature we see in more aquatic groups. That's the same with the aquatic crocs. Their tail vertebrae are more elongate and compressed than other phytosaur tails. Now, there are Many phytosaurs who we don't have the tails from, so there's still a lot of information missing from the tails as for the overall group, but these do seem to have better paddle-like tails. Mm -hmm. And so there does seem to be evidence that while the group overall is likely semi-aquatic, there may have been some almost aquatic phytosaurs. Interesting, which is fascinating for the general reason of just, yeah, you went into the ocean, that's very cool. But once again, that is also a thing that crocs did. Yep. Uh, Metria rinked crocs from the Mesozoic, which were marine, right, very much ocean dwelling. But we have, as we've discussed before, very ocean friendly crocs today. Yep. We've got at least a couple of species of saltwater crocodiles that do pretty well in the ocean. Absolutely. And continuing on that comparison, there's also some potential evidence. I only found one or two studies for this of more terrestrial phytosaurs. Mm. Uh, there was at least one study in 2013 that described the phytosaur Nicrosaurus as being potentially more terrestrial, and as they put it, secondarily terrestrial, that it likely developed a more terrestrial lifestyle from the semi-aquatic lifestyle that seems to be the common for phytosaurs. This was based off of the fossil deposit they were in, as well as features. I believe this was one of the more robust skulled phytosaurs, and has similar features to other phytosaurs, which could potentially mean that this was not the only one. There are also trackways that give evidence for some of these various lifestyles. Now, these are ichno genuses, genera, so the tracks have been given names, but they are pretty confidently attributed to phytosaurs. Synactichnium, which is a trackway from the middle 
maybe early Triassic. Uh, so this would be early evidence of phytosaurs, but we just don't have any physical body evidence mm-hmm. of that phytosaur. But it seems to match a phytosaur based on the positioning of the feet and how we think uh, phytosaurs would have held their limbs as well. And it seems to indicate a more terrestrial positioning and, and gait as well as I think the habitat it was in, which would be evidence for early phytosaur, cool, mm-hmm. terrestrial phytosaur, cool. And if that's true, that might indicate that earlier phytosaurs might have been more terrestrial. Or once again, that just there was a terrestrial branch. Right, right. But like our weird snouted early phytosaur, this could be indication that that's indicative of their early evolution or maybe just... Just an early weirdo. An early weirdo. (laughs) So we still don't know. They did make the point that before the Triassic and the Permian this kind of semi-aquatic predatory lifestyle was occupied by different groups. Other reptilomorphs and amphibians, mm-hmm. like the Timnospondyles, were filling this croc-shaped group. There are extremely crocodile-shaped Timnospondyles that would have maybe been occupying this space, so there might not have been any early semi-aquatic phytosaurs because there was too much competition. Is one of the ideas, but we don't actually have any solid evidence to say that confidently, but that's been thought of as to what early phytosaur evolution might have looked like with a couple of instances that might slot into that hypothesis. But by far the most referenced trackway is Apatopus from the late Triassic. This is very confidently identified as phytosaur. It matches the foot structure very closely. It seems to support a semi-aquatic lifestyle as well, partially because of the similarities to crocodile trackways, but also that there is a scarcity of Apatosuchus versus the abundance of swimming trace fossils in the same areas that indicate likely phytosaur swimming traces. But there is actually some controversy around this trackway because it seems to indicate a high walk, which would indicate phytosaurs were capable of very upright gait with their legs almost under the body, which for a long time was considered a very archosaur trait. Yes, among dinosaurs reptiles. do it. And crocs are famous for sometimes doing that, pushing their whole body yep. up off the ground. That's one of the unique things about their limb structure is that they can transition from a more lizard-like stance to a more dinosaur-like stance. If this is the case, if phytosaurs could do that, if this is indeed phytosaur footprints, that might indicate that the high walk is something characteristic of potentially ancestrally to both Archosauria and Phytosaurs, unless it was evolved separately. Yeah. So lots of implications, and there is some debate as to whether people are willing to denote it as Phytosaur based off of that. Interesting. You know, stuff like that makes it really start to seem like true crocs are just copying (laughs) off of the work of the Phytosaurs. Yeah, it's it's always... (laughs) High walks, osteoderms, marine habits, sitting in the river's edge and eating prey and water and land. Yeah, it's a lot like how we kind of complain whenever they call the Struthiomimids like ostrich mimics. Yes, ostrich mimic dinosaurs. It's like, well... You no. came first. Yeah. No, those were there way before ostriches. Yeah, so... <laughs> or a lot of people say ichthyosaurs. Well, yeah, ichthyosaurs evolved the same shape as dolphins. It's like, well... Mm, no. Th- th- dolphins act, as a matter of fact. <laughs> <laughs> this is a case where crocs evolved phytosaur-like body shapes. But in fairness, again, Timnospondyles did it way before they did. Right. And, and even before that, probably a bunch of the earliest tetrapods on land were doing the croc thing. Oh, yeah. So, but uh, in deference to Crocs, they have arguably done it best. Oh, yeah. They've definitely done it longest. (laughs) (laughs) Just like there are lots of things that have evolved long, limbless bodies, but none of them have been nearly as successful as snakes. (laughs) Absolutely. Now, one more surprising area that might be similar between these two groups is there is maybe evidence of parental care. In phytosaurs. In phytosaurs. Mm. This has been brought up a couple of times based off of a few specific findings. The one, though, that I found with the the most robust evidence was a 2020 study of an Indian phytosaur assemblage of multiple phytosaurs from the late Triassic in the Tiki Formation. 
Minimum, there were 21 phytosaurs. Wow. In this deposit. Oh, what do you call a group of phytosaurs? Ooh. Is it a basque of phytosaurs? Would it be a basque? I, they probably were basking. <laughs> oh, man. A high walk of phytosaurs. There you go. <laughs> Listeners, please suggest uh, a group name for phytosaurs. In this group, it seems that they were mostly juveniles and subadults, with only a few seeming to be fully grown. Now, this is unique in and of itself because there are specimens that seem to indicate younger phytosaurs, but they are almost always fragments. It's very rare that we get decent specimens of what seem to be young phytosaurs, which is also difficult to confirm because it could also just be a small species of phytosaur. Right. So it's hard to say for sure that it's young, but based on the assemblage and the association, they have denoted the smaller specimens as young also because they show less ossification, less fusion in their skeletal bones. Mm. The, the, the skeleton was still forming, yeah. potentially. It seems like it was still growing, much like a young child's bones is going to have parts that have yet to fuse, mm -hmm. whilst our adult skeletons are fused in those places. There's also a notable absence of the well-defined muscle scars found on the larger specimens that seem to indicate less developed musculature in those smaller skeletons. And some of the ornamentation is less extreme. Uh, so like the crests and things mm -hmm. like that that are potentially signaling structures. Yes. Also, also just for so that we can all picture this. The orbits were disproportionately large. Big eyes. Big baby eyes. <laughs> it is thought that this is a mass death assemblage, that these phytosaurs died together. The the taphonomy, the, the evidence from the deposit seems to support that. The researchers noted that this kind of assemblage of phytosaurs is not actually that unusual. There are multiple other cases where multi, you know, a, a couple or a few or multiple phytosaurs are found in association with one another. So there's definitely some sort of potentially gregarious, you know... It's group living. Group living, whether it's social or whether it's that you just all bask together like gators do, mm -hmm. that they're not solitary necessarily in life, or at least for a time we're not solitary. Right. There are some that are almost as ridiculous as this one. There was one from the Chinle Formation that had 10 different skulls. Wow, the that's same right here in New Mexico. Mm -hmm. Right here in the U.S. over in New Mexico. And so these kinds of deposits are not actually that rare, but some form of group living does not explain the overabundance of young phytosaurs in this deposit. Right. The researchers suggest that the only real way to suggest that is that the young lived in some sort of cohorts, that the young grouped together, which often goes along with parental care which explains the adults that are present mm -hmm. so this does seem to line up very well with the hypothesis of parental care now i don't think there are any other deposits that show this kind of mix of adult and young so this is the only one i've found in the research so it's still a very new hypothesis still very just the bare beginnings of this considering this right and there are other potential explanations for an assemblage like that absolutely but they also pointed out that if we're comparing them to crocs, and even though they are not within archosaurs by the current consideration, parental care is very common in archosaurs. Yes. Like, and, and even if they're not within archosaurs, if they are close to archosaurs, mm -hmm. they can potentially be expected to share a lot of features. Exactly. So birds are well known for parental care today. Every croc group today has some form of parental care, some of which is extreme, where both male and female will help in guarding the nest or mm -hmm. even guarding the young. Yeah. Parental care is very widespread across dinosaurs. Yes, exactly. Uh, there's even cases, uh, I think the gharials do this, and I've, ugh, I feel like there's another species I'm forgetting, where uh, adults will take turns watching multiple females Young. Oh, yeah, yeah. The young will group together in these massive hordes. That's why you see those pictures of gharials just covered in babies <laughs> on their back. And one adult will hang back to continue to guard it at all times. Uh, and I think they switch out or just someone is always left behind. And they made the point that even with the current grouping and placement of phytosaurs, lepidosaurs also have parental care. Yep. 
there, there are, are lizards that yes. are parents. There are snakes that take care of their young. So phylogenetic bracketing wise, parental care makes it, it is very reasonable. Yeah, for not dinosaurs. out of the question. It is not weird at all if they have it because both branches that they are near also have it in abundance. But also there does seem to be some evidence. Uh, there has been some previous evidence that suggested this, but has since been kind of overturned. There were mm. potential nests that were described, but I think those were re-identified later as geologic structures, like gotcha. abnormalities, right. not so. actually nesting structures. So th- it's not the first time parental care has been and parental behavior has been suggested in phytosaurs, but this is the most recent solid evidence that you will see noted quite often. So potentially another similarity between yeah. them and cro- or between crocs and them you know we should say <laughs> and with that we can conclude our discussion of phytosaurs what a cool group of reptiles i love them so much they are fascinating they're so interesting both in their similarities and differences to crocs well it, it all makes it seem like you know like we said at the beginning you'd look out your window and go oh that's a croc but then if you watched it for a while it'd be a weird croc yeah it would start doing stuff that was like that that's mostly what a croc would do, but the way you're moving is a little weird, or the way that you're interacting with your environment is a little you seem like a wrong croc. Yeah. Well, I would love to watch them eat something, like chew a piece of food. Yeah. Because with those weird teeth, you've gotta be doing something very distinct. Like, did you did you do that like cat thing where you chew it down to the cheek <laughs> and you are chewing pieces off or something? Or like what were you doing? So I yeah. They are very, very interesting, uh, very cool, tragically underrepresented in our popular media. Yeah. Let's get let's get a phytosaur movie. Yes. If anybody knows of a case where phytosaurs have shown up in something, uh, let us know. Absolutely. Make a comment. I can't remember having seen a phytosaur show up in like any TV or movies or stuff. Yeah, I have like a one little figure of a phytosaur, but I haven't found many memorabilia stuff. Uh, and if we make that phytosaur movie, don't let Trevor Rowe. <laughs> no no he's had his time don't in the, don't in tell the, trevor on the spotlight hey if you want to see more pictures and more links and stuff about phytosaurs you can check out the blog post that uh, will be up when this episode goes out absolutely but before we wrap up the episode entirely we have one last section we have another bonus benefit to, to our patrons which if you're at a certain level you can ask us a question and we will answer that question here on the podcast. And today's patron question is... From Lydia, who asks a very topical question. Lydia says, with Croc and Snake Month coming up, I have another speculative evolution question. How would you evolve a Croc-like snake and a snake-like Croc? I think we've discussed this a little bit on maybe one of the Q&As. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think this has come up before. I think it has. Uh, a, a snake like croc probably isn't too bit too big of a stretch. Yeah, they're already kind of long bodied with pretty small limbs. Yes, I can absolutely see, especially if it was like a marine croc. Mm-hmm. You know where, you know, which is one of the ideas for a uh, snake evolution that they may have started swimming. That yeah, if you're out in the water, you don't like paddles can be helpful for maneuvering, but you don't need them. To be able to move in the water. Especially if you have a big tail and a flexible body. Yeah. Croc uh, bodies would probably need to become a bit more flexible. Extremely so. For a true snake-like habit. Yes. So I could definitely see that swimming style becoming more and more common. And I don't know if we would... I don't know how much it would take to get, like, the more snake-like feeding strategies and stuff. Yeah. Like... that's crocs have famously very non-jointed skulls yes they're very rigid skulls and that's part of what gives them such a strong bite force Mm -hmm. whereas snakes have an extremely mobile skull which helps them to manipulate prey which is important when you can't handle stuff so one other option is for the snake crocs to just eat smaller easier prey yeah or i just now thought of this they could go the eel route uh, there are river eels, which have extremely sharp, scary little teeth, and they will eat, they will scavenge stuff, and they'll eat from large prey, and they do it with death rolls. Okay. They grab on, and then they spin their long serpentine body and mm-hmm. twist chunks off. 
So I, you could get eel crocs ooh. probably more easily than a terrestrial snake croc. Yeah. But the it would still be serpentine. The other option is that they start burrowing. Yeah. Which is the other and, and potentially more well more well supported these days hypothesis for early snake evolution is as ancestral burrowers. Uh, which is a little harder to get for a croc. What? Because they're big. But you do have burrowing crocs. But they do dig. They make tunnels. Gators make gator holes and they make burrows. So, so that... an underground croc is not unreasonable. So, And that's another potential uh, incentive to reduce the limbs to get them out of the way. Probably shorter snouts mm-hmm. that are less unwieldy. So our two options for snake crocs are either... Eel crocs or graboid crocs. Yeah, right. And if you <laughs> went with the burrowing crocs, it would almost certainly start with one of these smaller species. Yes. Who already have shorter snouts typically and already are not going to have to <laughs> make giant caverns. Yeah. <laughs> As for croc like snakes, that's a little like trickier well my first in my first thought is that you start with something like an anaconda Mm -hmm. some sort of big boa or python that is already predisposed for habits especially like an anaconda in the water Mm -hmm. and which already have bigger stronger sturdier skulls yes that you could have something a little easier to evolve towards a grabbing chomping skull rather than that manipulating skull that snakes have absolutely and having big prey around which mm-hmm. also fits very nicely for and an a anaconda big, big body mm-hmm. so that would fit well you're not gonna you're not likely to get limbs again no that's you're probably not gonna get legs back uh but the armor getting that more armored croc like body type there was one bit of research based on when we see early croc armor and and based on that the osteoderm evolution throughout the croc lineage there has been a suggestion i think this was a brochure paper but i don't remember uh that the initial pressure for osteoderm evolution in crocs for armor in crocs was not defense from predators but defense from interspecific combat Mm. That croc on croc violence was what drove the armor. Uh, so if bow, if a bow or a python lineage lost those vestigial legs completely mm-hmm. and needed something else to fight each other with, and you get those bigger skulls for biting and then more armor on the backs. Yeah. Uh, the armor, there are legless armored lizards. Yes. Uh, glass lizards have osteoderms. Mm-hmm. And you could also, it doesn't have to be full-on osteoderms, there are snakes that have more prominent scales mm-hmm. and scute-like scales. I'm thinking for uh, just for an example of like dragon snakes, yes. which have these rows of scutes down the back. So you could potentially get scalation that could help with defense as well as with uh, oct- hydrodynamic yes. uh, swimming and such. Yeah, well, that's one of the reasons why they think... Uh, at least I know this has been studied with alligators. The bumpiness of their face has been suggested that it makes them stealthier in the water because mm-hmm. like a golf ball, water moves along the surface and it doesn't create turbulence the same way as a smooth surface would. And that there's, they've done a uh, 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 hydrodynamic studies with, you know, particles in the water and laser capture to m- mark the movements because it basically what happened was someone noticed that the strike of an alligator is slower than the reaction time of a fish. So they shouldn't be able to catch fish underwater, but they do all the time. Mm-hmm. And they re- that was where they said, well, maybe there's something that's delaying the fish's reaction. So it could be for something like that, that you get more rugose, bumpy yeah. skin for fish hunting underwater. The other thing you'd probably have to do in order to get a snake lineage that evolves like crocs is to remove the crocs from the ecosystem yes <laughs> because that's the other thing that any big snake that's around that could potentially occupy a similar niche in the world today there are crocs that live in that same ecosystem yep and that's some pretty serious competition so we're gonna need to drive amazonian crocs extinct <laughs> and then hope that our anacondas become more specialized for taking down very large prey and possibly uh, fighting each other. Ooh, here's another idea for how to get snakes there. Scavenging. Mm-hmm. That would give them a reason to start dismembering. Yeah, and instead to lose, of swallowing whole. 
to lose that kinesis in the skull yeah. that, that those joint that all that jointedness which might not be as important if you're being able to take apart food or if you don't have to struggle with the prey you don't have to coil around it anymore you can start as a scavenger yeah and that gives you a lot of the, that would give you a lot of the croc aspects with their digestion and everything like we denoted with vul- vultures yeah Great question, Lydia. Absolutely. These are some thoughts. Uh, <laughs> listeners, uh, tell us if you have thoughts. Pop on the social media, pop in the Discord, where we've got this subject fits in both Croc Talk and Snake Talk. Yeah. So there will be a place for it on the Discord this month and next month. <laughs> so you can check it out. Hey, hop down to the episode description to find links to our social media, links to our Zazzle store with merch. There's Croc and Snake Month merch up on the Zazzle store. There sure is. Links to the Discord. Links to our other recent episodes, Silver Screen Science, Croc Conservation with Dr. Tejas, and a link to our Patreon where you can decide to support us, support what we do, our science communication efforts, and this summer in particular, support us while at the same time supporting Croc and Snake Conservation efforts at our new Croc and Snake Month tier. Thanks again to the requesters for suggesting this episode and to our new patrons. And even our old patrons. As always, there is a blog post that will accompany this episode on our blog. Link, believe it or not, in the description (laughs) with more info, more pictures, more links for people who want to do a deeper dive on Phytosaurs. And with that, we can wrap up this episode. And this will be the last episode of Croc Month. Oh, that's true. Uh, How sad for you. Quiet moment, everyone. A moment of silence. Snake Month is coming up. Not nearly as silent as I would have liked. (laughs) (laughs) Once July gets here, it's going to be snake month. So stay tuned for that. But it is not snake month yet. I will will hold back my excitement. We've got some more croc month stuff coming up before we get there. We release episodes, dear listeners, every fortnight. Every single one of them. Stay tuned for episode 143, whatever that's going to be about. (laughs) Until then, take care and... Think croc-shaped thoughts. You can decide whether they're <laughs> phytosaur-shaped or croc-shaped or timnospondyle-shaped. You count crocs as you go to sleep. Yeah, right? <laughs> as they slowly meander over <laughs> riverbanks. Count, count them all climbing over a fence. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everyone. Toodles. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.